Hi, I'm Henry from Building Momentum. Pause. And I'm Laurel, also from Building Momentum. <laughs> and we're here to tell you about what we did and the problems that we solved when we went down to North Carolina to help the Marine Corps do disaster relief. So this past hurricane season was particularly intense, with, especially with Florence hitting North Carolina and the South Carolina coast. We as a company were actually activated to go to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina and help the Marine Corps in their post-Florence recovery efforts. And one of the problems that they, they encountered when the hurricane hit was measuring levels of gas in gas tanks for generators for very particular buildings, say hospitals, incomes, and service. Uh, nobody, they had to run out with dipsticks, actually physically measure the gas tanks. So we decided to come up with a quick, innovative solution to solve that problem. There were a lot of issues with this problem set because for starters, none of the generators were similar on base. Camp Lejeune actually has about 420 so generators servicing all different kinds of purposes on their base. And we had to come up with a solution that could be adaptable and teachable for all 420 of those generators. Once given the problem, we, uh, we had a, a gas canister just to kind of look at and to kind of base our entire model around. We wanted it to be universal, so we thought a four bolt pattern, bolting it to the top of a gas canister and then label and allowing some of the electronics to fall inside was probably the best bet. And as you can see from this video here, we, we went through a couple of iterations. So we started out with a small version and then we realized that the electronics needed a bit more space to breathe and live. Um, otherwise, by folding things in on itself, it could all kind of damage and, and not work when we show it or use it. Um, so we increased the size, we made it a bit sturdier, we, we beefed it up a bit, we you know, focused on those fillets because you always got to fillet a good corner. And, um, and we finished up with a really great looking box, which looks almost exactly like this. Uh, I like to call it the Iron Man box, mainly because it has a nice ring on the top and is in uh, gold and red. So it's, it's kind of badass and we are, we are superheroes. Yeah. Um, but all electronics get put on here, including a LiPo battery, a potentiometer uh, that moves up and down with the fuel. And then a little Arduino a microcontroller goes inside with a radio and transmits all of that information back to a main hub where it can request and collect all of that information. But this little box here is what's going to eventually sit on top of a bunch of generators around uh, the Camp Lejeune base. Now, on the electronics encoding side of the system, there are essentially two major parts. There's the fuel gauge, which is the part that actually sits on the generator and is the part that's measuring the fuel level. And there's the handheld receiver, which kind of acts like the hub, which can ask all of the fuel generators, or the fuel gauge generators, what level they're at. But first, let's talk about the fuel gauge. So essentially what this system does is it measures the fuel level. Now, we used a potentiometer on an arm that essentially would turn as the fuel gauge drops. And that would do two things. It would light up an LED ring, which has 12 segments. And it also would convert it into a fuel percent to be sent to the handheld receiver. With this system, and pretty much every system, there's an input, there's a process, and there's an output. Now for the fuel gauge, the input is going to be our value from the potentiometer. Just based on how the Arduino, that is the brains of the whole operation, how it reads voltage. Now the way that we did this was using a process called MAP. The Arduino code actually has this as a built-in function. So essentially what we can do with MAP is that we can give it a current value and that current value's possible range. So in our case, that was the value from our potentiometer and then the range, 0 to 1023. And then we could give it a new range and then using its math on the back end, we don't have to touch any of the scary math, it figures out what that new output is. So that's how we get our outputs and our end gauge values on the fuel gauge. Now this part's a little trickier. We have to start talking about a radio communication now. For the handheld receiver, all of these things had an Arduino Mega as the brains of it. Those are microcontrollers that essentially do one thing over and over very well. What we wanted to be able to do was with one handheld receiver, we wanted to be able to message all five of the fuel gauge, uh, the, the fuel gauges on generators in an area. 
So this is actually doing something called a star configuration. So imagine a map, and at the center is my handheld receiver. And then scattered around it are generators, numbers one, two, three, uh, let's say five and six. Now, the handheld receiver can actually talk to all of the generators all at once. When it says something, it's actually shouting it to all of them. But the generators can only talk to the handheld receiver. So if my handheld says, hey, generator number five, generator number five is gonna be listening for that. And because it hears five, it knows that, hey, that's my name. And it's going to say, hi, I heard my name. Here's my field percentage. And it sends it back. Now, generators one, two, three, and six, they're also going to hear it. But they, because they know that their name's not five, they're like, hey, that's not my name. I'm three. I don't want to do that. They're not going to respond with anything. And they're actually not going to hear generator five's uh, fuel level either because it's only talking back to the handheld receiver, which is great for things like encryption and security of communication. So these were kind of the two parts of our system. We have that input, process, output. That's just the basis of all of programming and electronics and general systems. Using these kind of two ends of it, we were able to marry them very well in this project. As Laura's just aptly pointed out, we have had a couple of fails with this print uh, throughout the course of our iteration and prototyping. So my handy friend, the, uh, the glue stick here, is going to ho hopefully mitigate some of that risk. Uh, I am literally just going to lather the bed of the 3D printer with a bunch of uh, glue, and hopefully that will you know, kind of make it stick down uh, a, bit, a bit easier and a bit, a bit better. So I'm, all I'm going to do is just go back and forth over the printing area. Seeing as this is quite a large print, it's basically going to be the entire in the entire build plate. And just adds another, another layer and stops the DLAM. Um, and then when I think I am happy, which happens rarely, but I'm going to hopefully start our print with, without fail. So I'm just going to plug in our SD card, get a print from SD, and then And there you have it. That was our solution to this problem set. Pretty much it's something that anyone would be able to do if you just have a little access to a 3D printer and a little bit of time on your hands. The great thing about our courses as well, uh, we took all of our knowledge and all of our skills down to North Carolina, taught all of those skills and then presented them with the same problem set at the end of the week. And they solved it in a completely different way. Uh, I thought that was you know, just a cool little snippet of what our training can provide. Thanks for watching.